morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Bush. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Demand Driven Technologies and delighted to be your host for today's webinar. It's a beautiful day here in Atlanta. Hope it's great where all of you are located. Our topic for the day is uh, our new autopilot functionality that we're bringing into IntuaFlow, and we're quite ex excited to uh, share this news and updates with you. A couple of footnotes here before we get started. First of all, the audience is expected to be rather large today, so everyone will be in listen-only mode throughout the webinar. Um, doesn't mean we're not interested in your questions and comments, so please, uh, if you have questions along the way, uh, please enter them into the question feature of your Zoom control panel. Uh, you'll be able to find that, and um, hopefully you'll all see that. And then as well, um, we will be recording the session, so you'll have access to that as well as uh, we'll be sharing the presentation file with you later today. And uh, we're also going to do a couple polling questions or a few polling questions during the session today. We would greatly appreciate your participation in this. It'll give us uh, some perspective on some of the topics we'll be covering and, um, and you know, give us a, a view. So with that, uh, Kevin, are you seeing my slide okay? Yes, yes sir. Okay. Uh, well, why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, our, from an agenda standpoint, I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about kind of the realities from a supply chain planning standpoint um, and from some of the challenges that we're going to be trying to address with the autopilot functionality today. And we'll then bring up uh, a little bit of a polling question or two to gauge kind of where you are individually on these uh, various topics. We'll talk a little bit about the limitations of safety stock settings or red zone settings. Um, and then we'll get into the vision about what autopilot is all about. We'll follow that up with a demonstration, um, do some closing comments and ask another polling questions as we get near the end there. I've shared this chart on a lot of our webinars. It is one of the things that continues to drive my thinking and our energy at DD Tech on what we're trying to do. Uh, this is a picture of data from the US Federal Reserve about US manufacturers. And essentially what it says is that inventory turnover rates over the last 25 years have not improved. And that's kind of a pretty mind-numbing uh, concept to think about in the, when especially you realize how much software investment companies have made over that time horizon, whether it was ERP deployments, uh, specific supply chain planning solutions and the like. In aggregate, you know, we've not made any real progress. And I think that represents an opportunity and a challenge to us at DD Tech and to all of you about what can we do to get to a better place. Another part of the story is, frankly, this concept that, you know, we've got a lot of complexity in supply chain, but at the same time, it seems like that turns into complex software. And my team gets kind of worn out on me using this metaphor all the time, but the way I look at it, it feels to me like users today are like the astronauts in the Apollo space capsule who were um, challenged with trying to get to the moon and back and literally were part of the computer. They were flipping switches, pushing buttons and knobs and things like that to get to the moon and back. It was the best of the best of the best. It was a dangerous journey. And, you know, and that's kind of what the state of play feels like. I mean, that those concepts uh, that are in all of the ERP systems around things like material requirements planning are basically ideas that were codified back in the 70s when the Apollo uh, missions were underway. Heavily dependent on the user, requires a lot of knowledge of the system itself, as well as the supply chain challenges that a given client's facing. Um, when you look to some of the settings, there's very little in the way of a visual way of confirming whether the setting is the right one. And, you know, just as an example, and this is the one we're going to focus on today, is around that age-old quest to find the right way to set proper safety stock values. Um, and it's really, really an interesting topic and one that if you go online with Google or any of your search engines, you will find example after example after example of the ways people have recommended or tried to uh, drive to getting the appropriate values for those um, elements. So with that, let's go to uh, our first two polling questions. Kevin, if you don't mind. Okay. 
Okay, the first question is, how often are you updating your safety stock settings? This is uh, an interesting question. Every time we meet with a new client, um, there tends to be a little bit of, well, kind of this, kind of that, but I'd be very interested to see kind of how these results uh, play out. We making progress, Kevin? Yes, we are. I'll give it a, a few more seconds. We are still getting responses. A few more coming in. I'll give it 10 more seconds. We're all waiting with bated breath. <laughs> Okay. Wow. Wow. Some folks, 17% are doing it weekly, 17% uh, monthly. Um, obviously, quite a few are not doing it that often. More than half is semi-annually um, or longer, it would appear. Very, 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 very interesting. Um, so from that, let's go to the next question then. And this one will be about how confident are you in the settings that you are establishing? And please, your participation is very useful for us. All right, waiting on a few more. I'll give it a few more seconds. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sixty-nine percent neutral or dissatisfied. About thirty-one percent uh, favorable on that. So, thank you so much for that. Very interesting. We'll share those results as well when we uh, send out the content after the webinar. So, appreciate that. Um, so, let's move on. Um, this is some of the examples. So, this is just based on some Google searching we've done over the years. Um, there are lots and lots of formulas out there. And I would expect that for most clients, many of their staff members would not really know how to interpret these formulas. There would typically be some individual who tends to be better with math, uh, who might be responsible for that. You can see there's different formulas for uncertainty about, about demand, uncertainty about lead time, uncertainty about lead time and demand, et cetera. There's goes on and on and on. You'll see tons and tons of examples about there. And, you know, I look at these and I say, well, what do you mean by uncertainty of demand? How uncertain is uncertain, right? And so it leaves a lot to the user to know and figure out what is the right formula. And oftentimes these kind of become what I would call a black box kind of solution where we've set up some business rules based on some of these formulas or some adjustments we've made uh, in our own environment. And, you know, you just kind of have to trust it because there is no illustration available that would demonstrate whether that setting was going to be correct uh, or not. So quite a bit out there in the uh, literature around supply chain around these. I don't want to be uh, belabor this any further, but suffice to say, lots and lots of stuff you can access. Not a lot of confidence out there that we're getting to the right place. We even implemented a concept called statistical buffer settings for, for the DDMRP aspects of our uh, platform. And these use conventional Z-score kind of technique as a way of creating a red zone factor. We had done some analysis on it. In the margins, it would create some better value. Some clients had some advocacy within uh, their environment around some of those um, 
formulas on the previous page, so we went ahead and implemented this. One of the experiences we found, though, was that they were a bit nervous. In other words, that depending on data quality and other things that may happen in the environment, um, they were actually going to become rather volatile and not conducive of generating user confidence. In other words, they were constantly checking if my buffer settings right and my buffer settings right. And so we have very few users that are actually taking advantage of this at this point in time. And along the way, we kept learning more and more and more as we were doing simulations with clients. I mean, we have a platform in the solution called um, Smart Buffer Profiler, which is based on the conventions that are described in the DDMRP literature about using ranges of lead times uh, and then ranges of variation levels. And the combination of two, those two would result in appropriate um, red zone values for your items. And this is all part of setting up your buffer profiles if you're familiar with the DDMRP concepts and the like. And that's very, very useful. We've delivered great results with our clients using this technique, but we also knew that there was more ground to gain and it would help answer the questions because oftentimes in the new implementation, users would say things like, well, how do you know that if I put, you know, 50% red zone safety on a COV of 51 to 100%, that's the right answer. And, you know, we would have validated things through simulations and the like, but it wasn't as reliable as we would have liked. And this is what really is behind all of that. Here are three different items, each with the same coefficient of variation of 130%, 1.3. And you can see that the size of the red zone, AKA the safety zone, goes from being 23% of the lead time of the item in this first example at the bottom, usage over the lead time. So in other words, if we're using the material at 100 per day, we have a 10 day lead time, our red zone would be 1,000, um, and we would have 230 units of safety coverage. So that's kind of like our safety zone value. Um, and at the top, we would have basically 10 times as much material. They all have the same level of variation. And what we started observing, and this is going over the years now, is that over and over again, we would find that items with the same COV actually needed much, much different settings. And so the idea that we can bucket in certain ranges has merit. It's better than what we've been doing historically. And it's been proven over and over and over again with all our clients that they get better results that way. But it's leaving some opportunity on the table because anytime we are working in ranges, the items at the high end of the range are probably getting less coverage than they need. And the items at the low end of the range are probably getting more coverage. You could obviously make these very fine grained and have lots and lots of buffers uh, settings. But in point of reality, it's not gonna address this problem. And the key here is that there's other factors that matter. For example, you'll notice the size of the green zones are larger in these two items with lower settings than they are in the top example. And so they inherit more coverage because their green zones are larger and require less in the red zone. And we don't really factor that in. As well, there's different lead times. You can see the time between an order being created and material arriving is kind of moderate here, a bit shorter here, and much, much shorter in the example up above. And what that represented is that the lead time factor has to play into this as well. There's other dimensions of your item attributes that really matters when we get into this. Things like your calendar. What is your operating calendar? Are you using planning calendars which dictate when you can order? There may be only certain days of the week that you're able to order on. And if you don't factor those elements in, you're not really grabbing the most holistic way of doing it. And then finally, and this is the part that really was compelling to me, is this notion that even though the COVs are the same, the shape of the demand is very, very different. And you can see that the, the pattern, the density, the clustering of demand, even though they average out to the same value, it's not the same fingerprint or it's not the same shape. And um, that was really kind of one of the key drivers. And I'm a musician. I love playing music. I'm always intrigued and I'm always frustrated when I can't remember the name of the song. I have the Shazam app on my phone and I can be in a restaurant literally and doesn't matter what part of the song is playing. 
click that button and literally within seconds, Shazam takes that analog sound wave out of the air, digitizes it, matches it to its library and comes back with the results. Tell you what artist, what album, blah, 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 all those kind of things. And if that's possible, then maybe there's a way that in a similar way, pattern recognition can play into us getting better red zone values because we can understand that it's not the statistics, but it's the pattern that we care about because how these demand pulses occur across the time horizon we're evaluating can have a big, big influence as well as those other attributes. So Shazam is part of the inspiration. And as well, you know, I'm a big fan of what SpaceX is doing. I think it's just amazing to realize that today and having been there as a little kid watching the first you know armstrong walk on the moon how far space exploration has advanced right where they can literally take civilians give them a few months training put them in a cool looking space suit and give them some ipads send them up on an automated journey you know and it's all done in such a clean and reliable way the rocket lands on its tail my god it's how, how can we as a human race, be so capable of engineering that, and yet we can't get to where simple safety stock values can't be better created for us, right? That makes no sense to me. And so that's really kind of the impetus behind what we've been doing in creating autopilot. We want to get you into that space capsule from the standpoint of your supply chain planning. And so we've taken a holistic approach. It's not just about demand variation or lead time elements or all that. It's about all of those things that influence the right values that you need. Take advantage of AI and ML, take advantage of those kind of concepts as well as other tools to leverage technology to correctly generate and validate for you that the item settings are, are actually correct. And do that and illustrate it to the user so that they're not trusting a black box on formulas that have no ability to understand but they can look at a picture and actually see that that in fact is going to be the right way to approach it. At the end of the day, our users should be able to let the system do most of the work. Why do we have planners who today literally check the math of the system and agree or disagree whether they should approve the orders it's recommending? So often over you know, worked and underpaid for the, uh, the tasks that they're doing and we should put them in a place where the system can do most of the work and they can focus on dealing with the exceptions in other areas where human intervention really ought to be required. In doing this, we enlisted the help of our clients. We wanted to make sure that we really, you know, landed the rocket on its tail, if you will, you know, that we were able to provide a solution that was going to give us them the kind of value that they were looking for in, in the concepts that we're talking about here. So Greif, Coca-Cola Beverages of Africa and Aptiv have all been great partners over the last several months. We've gone through a very, very steep learning curve together. And I deeply appreciate um, their contributions to what we've done. They've given us data to work with. They gave us feedback and suggestions. They've been tested in live environments as we gain uh, progress on the uh, solution platform itself. And without their help, it would be uh, a much more difficult journey. So again, thank you to those clients for their participation in the activity. Um, in phase one here, and this is the first phase, so we're starting with kind of a, a narrower scope, but one that is so critically important, um, is obviously the top priority is gain confidence in the system. Get to where you can trust that you can take your hands off the wheel, you know, be that pilot in the commercial airliner who's really not flying the plane most of the way across the Atlantic, but really trusting the system to work for him or her. Make it easier to onboard items with appropriate settings. Don't make that such a, a challenging effort for the users. Uh, utilize AIML uh, technologies to help create dynamic buffers, DDMRP type buffers or static min-max kind of buffers and help with that whole process of selecting where can we hold inventory reliably to ensure we get better results. Part of this, though, involves this concept of identifying outliers. Our philosophy has been that if there's flaws in your data, we don't want to simulate and generate a result for you that you are inherently not going to trust because you'll know something's wrong. It may be outliers in demand. It may be other item attributes that are missing. It may be certain settings that you ought to take a second look at. And so part of it as well is this idea of exception 
data exceptions and other elements that can, regardless of how you're planning, help you with the data management aspect of your system. Because obviously the more clean your data is, the more reliable the outcomes will be. So autopilot will exclude those that are not compliant with the data exception uh, filters that we've set up and allow you to go focus on those when you've resolved them, whether it's an outlier or whatever, uh, then you'll be able to get out, um, autopilot settings for those. And at the end of the day, do all of this in a transparent and automated, but easy to follow process. Make it something that the users are very, very confident in so that they can have the ability to trust the system to do the work for them. Okay, so we're gonna go into a demo now. And hang on, I'll just get out of here and we'll go over to um, our first screen. And this is Autopilot. What you're looking at is an item that has above here your demand pattern for the past year. You're seeing the uh, comparison of two different um, sets of settings, buffered settings using DDMRP logics for dynamic buffering and min-max settings, which are there for um, traditional min-max thinking. Oftentimes, especially as you get to slower moving items, min-max settings may be more appropriate because if there isn't enough of a recurring demand data, uh, you may find that the DDMRP buffering is difficult uh, to synchronize to get you the best results. And we'll provide values for the three different uh, service level settings that you set, kind of an ABC classification and we'll talk about how you set those up. But in this case, we see a comparison. And in, in, in this case, we actually see that a min-max setting, given the shape of this demand pattern, would give us the ability to achieve 100% availability of material, service level 100%, with a fairly substantially lower inventory level. We've also generated results for um, two other service levels, 94, 95 kind of percentage range, here you see DDMRP is a little more favorable in that regard, and then down at a 90% target range as well. And the idea here is that we want to utilize these illustrations as a way for the user uh, to gain uh, confidence in what is being recommended. So the idea of a visual uh, reinforcement that, hey, we've looked at your item, we've put this on automated planning for the past year using your actual demand history, Given the shape of your demand, here's the kind of safety levels you would need to ensure you could hit the desired service level. And so that's kind of, to me, the, the graphical representation and the feedback from our clients and the advisory board has been very, very positive about, you know, this UI panel itself. When we go take a step back, this is kind of the workbench, if you will, or the operating console for autopilot. And it's generating the results. And you can set up different cohorts of items here. We're looking at the six pack, two liter items, but you can use filtering and create all sorts of different save views because a lot of clients as they're starting to implement, they want to go in kind of a measured approach. Let's start with these parts from this vendor or these parts in our make item portfolio and start phasing in the autopilot settings. And this allows them to review those on a uh, segment by segment level. You can see at the top here, we're illustrating what the autopilot target inventory value is. It's about $2 million less than what our current value is for the 11 items that we've selected. We're hitting 100% service, which was our target for the uh, uh, A classification. Um, two of them, only two of them in this case, are going to be buffered using DDMRP concepts. The balance are quite viable with min max. Not to say that you may not want to always or, or more often override that and utilize buffering because in some cases, especially if you've got increasing rates of demand or there's changes in some forecasting things that you know about, you may find that you're going to be better off utilizing those. Um, and so it's great because we can see here what our inventory improvements are at the item level. So I can go here to item 150971 see that our inventory improvement in this case would be $733,000. If we come into the Power BI report, looking at our current settings that we're using for that same item, 150971, uh, you can see we were showing a slightly greater reduction of 790,000. So we're, two, we're about 
you know, relatively close on this between this item here and what we're showing in our current settings. But what we have seen is that this one perhaps is assuming too aggressive of a change. And we'll have a chance here in a second to show you how that might be the case and how we would evaluate that. Uh, we can look at another item here um, on the uh, panel, uh, 866, that's this guy right here. And you'll see that it's showing a 37K reduction. And yet, if we go to that same item in um, the current settings, it's showing a 73K reduction. So this one, we're actually saying that we believe you need to carry a bit more inventory. And that would be you know, a way to kind of get a sense check on are the settings coming along in a valid way for us? Each of these, then you can pop these open and open up that same view that we had here. Uh, where was that item I was just looking at? We'll bring that up and you'll be able to see a couple things here. One is the autopilot page panel will show you the difference between the min-max settings and the buffered settings for the three uh, target service levels. And then it will also show you the actual simulations, starting with the demand pulses that that item has experienced over the past year and then showing what the illustrations are. So we're looking at the items levels, we're, we're confirming them. Uh, you know, we're using this kind of platform to generate the right results. Here you see the min max is gonna give us much better settings. Uh, it's compensating for this. It's avoiding this period of heavier um, inventory accumulation and giving us better results. And you'll see that the others are populating here and you can compare them for each of the three levels. So very, very good feedback from the clients on this. We're giving you illustrations. These autopilot uh, settings are quite useful from that regard. Now, there's also a need though at times to uh, show you, let's go back to this first item. And let's say from an SNOP standpoint, we want to validate this. So here we've run a reverse simulation in our SNOP module for that item, showing basically the exact same graph that we were looking at over here um, on the other item. But with the current settings, the, not the autopilot settings, whoops, sorry, we are actually showing uh, that we would not be able to achieve the service level. So. Remember, I had talked earlier when we use the Smart Buffer Profile, we're doing it in ranges. It had evaluated the same history horizon, uh, but based on the COV stats, it was not giving us the right results. And so actually using the traditional setting, we would have had four days of stock out on this item over the year. We can then uh, rerun this and we'll turn on the autopilot settings. And we'll pick the autopilot feature and we'll generate that. And you'll see that it's going to correctly uh, address that period of heavy demand. We end up with no days of stock out. We have 100% service level, but it costs us you know, 469K in average inventory. And that's over the period of this grayed out service window, which is the window that we're evaluating. Because we're using a simulation, we have to have it to kind of prime the pump, if you will. So we have to wait at least the lead time uh, for that item's uh, simulation to be valid. We can then go and look at uh, the min-max settings. Whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, and we can evaluate those. And we'll see again that we're gonna get better results using a min-max value. Uh, it gives us better inventory turnover rates, a lower average inventory value. Now, we can also do this to evaluate the forward-looking simulation. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to turn this off and we're going to look forward again. We're going to go back to that M23C uh, buffer profile, turn off autopilot, and we'll go ahead now and run the simulation going forward. So we've evaluated and everything is done on what is my historical demand pattern B. The reason for that is that demand pulses from the actual market are going to be more volatile than your forecast. You can see forecasts tend to have some smoothing effects to them. Here we're seeing uh, utilizing the current profile, we would get good results. We're getting 100% service at 385K of average inventory. If we then turn on autopilot, we can evaluate uh, what those results would be with that setting going forward. Now, in point of fact, we know that this item is actually having increased demand, that buffers are getting larger over time, 
because the rate of demand in the forecast is higher than the one we had in the past. Higher level of inventory value is reflective of that. We can then show the min-max setting of autopilot for that forward-looking view and see that as well. And it'll show that it's gonna give us uh, great inventory turns, a very, very healthy pattern. We don't really have any minimum stock exposures along the way, and we're in real good shape uh, across that. So the autopilot gives us the generation of settings. They're provided in a visual way. We also have the SNOP simulation capability to further ratify and gain confidence that we're getting the right values because we're proving it historically. And we also are validating it against our forward-looking projections. And these can be done in bulk utilizing the uh, SNOP module. So not just at an item by item level. Now, one of the things we talked about was data exceptions. So the data exceptions report is really there to help us ferret out those items that don't have good data elements. And you can see across the horizon here, we didn't have demand, uh, did not meet a minimum threshold. I'll show you that setting in a minute. There's a threshold below which if you're trying to hold inventory, it becomes much more problematic. So we are kind of utilizing those as kind of the gates for the different service levels we might want to achieve. If you don't have material costs and no, don't have base lead times, those are things that make it problematic to be able to actually compare results or even generate simulations. Sometimes MOQs can exceed interval days, and those would be items that are on a planning calendar. And if the MOQ is bigger than the interval days, then you have missed potentially an ordering window that you would want to take advantage of. And obviously that can be a bit of a challenge. So we want to flag those. Expired part demand pattern is one that had demand earlier in the simulation horizon, but none after that. And why would we set up buffer stock if an item looks to be phased out? Now, it may be that that's okay, and we're gonna still include that. A new part demand pattern is the opposite. It's an item that has apparently recently come into service and we'll probably want to create uh, appropriate settings for that. We can do that, but we want you to be, you know, kind of overseeing those elements. Those to me are kind of those exception situations. If we're missing minimum order quantities or order cycle values, those will be uh, another item that we want to check into. If there's no demand. What are we going to do? Uh, if we have no way to generate a uh, paradigm for that, here, this is a, uh, a label that's a new revision. It's going to inherit the demand from its child. We have to implement a part transition to affect that, but those would be things we'd want to clean up. If MOQ is greater than total demand, there's a number of the cases in this demo set that illustrate that. You have to go ask yourself the question, why are we signing up for so, mater so much material? We're using a full year horizon. If I'm not using up all of that inventory in one year, oh my goodness, you know, that's going to be a turnover rate, uh, inventory turnover rate for that item of less than one. And maybe we ought to take a hard look at that. So here are this item L22 over here that you can see. I pulled it up in the workbench. Here's its demand pattern for the past year because the minimum order quantity is so big, right? Um, I'm not even using anywhere near half of the inventory in the year. This one would probably take more than two years to utilize. And this is a way to be kind of a sense check. Uh, should we go back through procurement? Maybe it's more viable for us to, you know, pay a bigger price for a smaller batch, a uh, smaller quantity, just because we would have less inventory overhang. What if this label transitions out because a formula change in this item, blah, blah, blah. You know, let's be um, careful here and not overcommit on inventory where we don't need to. And then outliers is about being able to manage uh, data uh, that is outlying. Now, in this case here, we don't have any demand history values that are outliers, but we have the ability to go in and edit the actual histories and make adjustments to improve them um, and make them modified. So there's a great deal of functionality to help you address these outlying situations, uh, but they're there as really kind of the exception cases that we want to put off to the side. So, and why we're doing that is we want you to have confidence in the settings. If we're simulating things that have noise in the data, you're not going to feel good about them. So let's clean up the exceptions and deal with those as we need to. And then we'll have the opportunity to uh, get the settings for those items when they've been addressed. Okay. 
Uh, talked about the settings. So these are kind of the foundation of where you start. I started at the end and kind of worked back to the beginning. Um, here you have the ability and you can do this at a location level or set them globally for your company. You can turn on and off the auto pay uh, feature. Um, what your demand pulses are uh, for the various service level thresholds and these can each be assigned by the uh, client to address the various uh, targets that they're trying to get to. Um, and so we've used 10 as the minimum pulses. Anything below 10 would not get an autopilot value for it. Some clients want to go further down on that, especially on repair parts and things like that. So we've got the flexibility to do that. We set an upper red zone factor limit. So I showed you in that illustration in the PowerPoint that the, the highest one was 220% of the usage over the lead time. Here we've set it at five times usage over the lead time. Uh, at some point, there's a diminishing return. If I go way up on this threshold, yes, I can hold buffer stock. Maybe for class A items, you might want to do that. And that's obviously your prerogative, uh, depending on the criticality of the item and things like that. But you have the ability to set what that upper boundary is. And we've seen in clusters of items, items with the same COV having a range of like point or 20% up to more than 500% required there. Um, what is the red zone safety factor? So let's say we're, you're feeling a lot of comfort about what we're generating in autopilot, but you just want to be a little more careful. You can also add to this a further minimum floor. In other words, you could add another 5 or 10%. We first run autopilot. It validates against a zero setting and then would add in whatever extra safety factor you want to build in. So early in the implementation, you could pump this up a little bit start to get the trial uh, going and, and evaluate that we're getting the right kind of results and then start to wean that down over time. You can look back over various horizons. Here we're using 52 weeks as far as uh, what the look back is gonna be. We're simulating over that same threshold. Um, we've got boundaries here to define new parts and old parts. So these are items that have uh, demand only in the last 13 weeks or expired parts would be items that only had demand in the first 13 weeks of that window that we've set. So you've got a good number of settings here to help configure the autopilot feature um, to meet your requirements. So that's kind of a quick overview. I mean, going back to this over uh, this first slide that we illustrated, each item is gonna be validated based on the analysis that the autopilot backend logic is doing we paint the illustrations for you and your users to review and confirm. We give you the ability through the data exception management to clean up noisy data so that you can get the valid settings. And we provide simulation platforms that allow you to gain that visual confirmation that the settings that we're providing for you are correct. Those site admin uh, features allow you to kind of calibrate these and kind of gain sense of confidence around what those values are that are gonna be right for your organization and really can help out uh, quite a bit in that regard. Okay, back on the slides, just a couple last points and we'll do one last polling question here before we wrap up. Um, so you could see that there was a mix there of items that are getting min-max recommendations, items that are getting uh, dynamic DDMRP buffer recommendations. We've observed here, and there's a couple of things that we're gonna do about this as well, um, is that oftentimes the settings between the two uh, comparisons are very, very close together. So we're gonna provide a further setting that will say, hey, within a certain tolerance range, if I wanna err on the side of a dynamic buffer, I'll do that. Um, and that will help balance that because sometimes literally it's looking, if they're only you know, $500 apart, um, maybe you'd want to prefer the dynamic setting or maybe you'd prefer the min-max setting. What we've seen is that, um, you know, where we see some trend in the consumption rate over time, we tend to see that the dynamic buffering is more favorable to that. Uh, that can be both increasing rates of consumption or declining rates of consumption. Uh, and those are factors that you can uh, to evaluate and, and make adjustments on. And then, you know, when static buffering tends to help is when it's a more volatile part. This item has a lot of demand pulses over the year, but obviously if we buffer, it's taking the worst case scenario. It's probably this cluster of demand in this period. And it's finding that to compensate for that, it really has to build a much heavier red zone. The red zone here is 
probably in the four to five times the usage over the lead time. Whereas a min-max setting is going to give us much, much more reliable results. And so this is kind of the boundary area between when is a dynamic buffer and when is a static buffer going to be better for us. And so you've got some visibility around that. Uh, and I think that's part of the continued process and the evolution of where we're going with the platform is build more and more intelligence around this, including some of those forward-looking evaluations that we were talking about a bit earlier. So very, very interesting. A lot of different data sets that we've looked at across the different industries. I mean, we've been working with beverage. We've been working in packaging. We've been working in automotive. And obviously, uh, we'll be expanding this now to more and more clients as we go for, forward. So I'm going to take a little break before I make some uh, final uh, comments here. Uh, Kevin, if you could bring up the, the final poll for us. Okay, I appreciate your responses here. Um, eager to see the results, as you can imagine. <laughs> And if once you've finished polling, if you have questions that you'd like to ask, please ask, because uh, we've covered an awful lot of ground in a short amount of time here. And uh, we really want to make sure that this is coming across in a clear and concise manner for all of you. All right, we'll give it a few more seconds. OK. I'll take that as a good answer. <laughs> um, and for those uh, of you that answered on the negative, I'd like to absolutely have a discussion with you to learn your concerns or feedback on that because uh, I, I, we very much have been listening to customers on this as we've gone through. So uh, thank you for your participation in those polls today. Very helpful information and we greatly appreciate that. Uh, so a couple closing comments. You know. Our goal is trust in the system. I want to get to a place where we really can have our users feel confident that the system is giving them the right recommendations. I think we've made good progress on this, but I think there's a lot more ground to cover. And clearly we want to stay at the task of getting it better and better and better. There's inherent limitations in statistical methods. That's clearly been illustrated over time. Um, it's not just the statistics. Statistics assume a normal distribution. That is not real life. We know all know that. And getting the math to be that correct is just very, very difficult. Um, we want the functionality to be easy to use. I think it provides great visual proof. Whether users are fully convinced about that may or may not always be the case. And uh, for those who have still doubts, obviously we want to understand what the reasons are for that so that we can address those. All of this should be solvable. If we can have civilians in outer space and rockets landing on their tail, then it's simply a matter of asking ourselves the right questions, perhaps, uh, than what we've been doing in the past. Um, certainly phasing in is my recommendation. Uh, take it a step at a time. And that way you can digest what's happening. That way you can get more and more comfortable with what your proper settings will be for your environment, um, but also gaining that user confidence. If we can get to that user confidence that the settings are right, then we can gain confidence in putting items on auto approval and removing some of the workload for users, putting them into that pilot scenario where they're monitoring and checking and doing an exception management involvement instead of constantly having to check the math of the system. Uh, the platform is going to be released by March 1st, perhaps a little bit earlier in the next version of Intuflow called uh, version 2024.1. So we're quite, quite excited about that. So with that, we've got a few minutes to take questions. Um, why don't we go to the questions? Kevin? Okay, let's do that. We had a fair few come in. Uh, so the first question from Ian is, I'm surprised to see so many of these simulations showing that a static min-max level is better than DDMRP. Do you have any insights into why that would be when DDMRP typically is able to show less inventory and less stockouts because of its dynamic sizing in a real world application? Yep, uh, very, very good question. I think the comparison should be between DDMRP and whatever statistical methods uh, have been in place historically. I don't argue that at all. They have done 
tended to be, do better. What the industry has lacked, though, are really more AI generated min max values. And we have found through this um, that that's it's often a quite competitive. And we also know that there's some clients that are out there that want to utilize min max. It's a simpler concept for them um, to address, but they also have, like most of you, you know, the inability to do that well or, you know, a difficulty in maintaining that on an ongoing basis. We started seeing that there were certain use cases that clients that were more on the make to order end of the spectrum where the number of items that could be DDMRP buffered was a relatively small percentage, but we also knew that we could generate better min max values for them. And as we started working on this, we started seeing that oftentimes min max was better at um, in terms of average inventory than a DDMRP buffer because there were times when the buffer was reacting in a uh, escalating way due to changes in the periods of demand, like things like that. So there's there's some absolute truth that this platform is giving us better min max settings on items. I mean, that's a unique case. I tried to show an example there at the end of the presentation where depending on the periodicity of the demand, what the shape is, sometime min max values are going to be better because it can find kind of what that peak of activity has been and build a buffer directly from that without having the dynamic nature. So hopefully that makes sense. I think the comparison of DDMRP to conventional safety stock settings has always tended to prove very positive for clients, typically getting them much, much better results. But this is a different kind of min-max and safety setting technique than what they've had access to in the past. Next question. Okay. Is there an offline job or calculation I need to do, or does the tool calculate these scenarios automatically? Um, yes, there is a background job that goes out and does all of the analysis for you. Uh, we would expect most clients would run this on perhaps a once a month basis more frequently if they felt the need to. Uh, it goes through and does all the heavy lifting of generating the results and provides them back into the Intuit flow environment that then can be brought up and visualized through the uh, platform that we've uh, shown you today. Okay, another question. When and how is it available to current users and what training will be made available? Yep, so um, the production version will be available in release 2024.1. Uh, we're, we're indicating March 1st. We think we can probably get the product out uh, a little bit earlier than that. Uh, and yes, we'll make uh, training materials available and we'll go through, um, we can assist clients that are interested in kind of phasing this in. So uh, just reach out to us and we'll uh, get in touch and help you get, get you organized. All right. Um, will this be available on NetSuite's version? Great question. Uh, not in this first release. Um, we expect to down the road now a little ways, uh, probably middle part, later part of the year to be able to generate these settings for the NetSuite users, but we don't have that functionality as yet. Uh, we wanted to build it into the um, the main product, the, the Intuit Flow that you've seen today, uh, which has tended to be leading the uh, enhancements that are done on the NetSuite side. All right, Eric, I got one more for you. Does this mean that the Smart Buffer Profiler will be phased out? Um, great. <laughs> Great questions. Um, yeah, I think you can see that autopilot is going to supersede that. That said, there are clients that are utilizing it that may not be ready to um, abandon that uh, for the time being due to change management aspects or other factors like that. So I don't have any plans right now. We don't have any plans for phasing out the Smart Buffer Profiler. Uh, there are elements of the platform that are actually utilized under the covers in the autopilot uh, platform itself. So there's kind of some already connective tissue between those two arenas. And so we don't have any immediate plans on that front. With where we believe we're going to go next on autopilot, there'll be some further enhancements to the existing capability you've seen today as well as a whole slate of other areas that we know we can explore. 
Um, things like uh, daily usage horizons. Uh, we've done a, a fair bit of groundwork on that. Um, a tool that would help you identify which buffered items don't need to be buffered in terms of helping decouple parent item lead times. Sometimes short lead time items are being buffered and carrying inventory on those. Um, and yet they're not helping compress the parent's lead time. And if the supplier is reliable, you may be better off just buying those to order. So there's a lot of other dimensions to this story that we're going to be uh, advancing on as we go forward. We wanted to take one of the most troublesome areas in material planning and give it a good whack with this first, uh, first venture into AIML. And I think we've done a big step forward there. Um, but there's a lot more ground to cover. I mean, you know, I want to get to where you are literally in something more like the SpaceX Dragon capsule where so much of the work is being done for you correctly in a visual way that you understand and agree with so that you can take your time and attention and focus on the exceptions and the other difficult issues that a, a human being needs to be involved in, right? There's so much of the work that we should be able to get automated but the keys to that unlocking that door is about user confidence and trust and making sure that the people whose jobs are on the line for making things right are confident that the system is actually helping them now. And um, that's very much the philosophy we're following uh, and are confident we're on a good path and we're using AIML in a pragmatic way uh, and seeing good progress as a result of that. So Kevin, any final questions come up? Um, no more questions, Eric, but would you be willing to talk about our simulation process for a second for those who'd be interested on the webinar? Sure. Yep. So we have, from the beginning of founding DD Tech, been committed to deriving tangible and sustainable results for our clients. I don't want to be any part of that picture, that first slide I showed you, which showed inventory turns hadn't improved, right? I'm not in the business to sell software. I'm in the business to help clients get better results. And so we've done simulations as part of the pre-sale activity. And we do this to help clients understand how the, our solution works. We learn about their demand patterns and how their challenges kind of emerge in their environment. And we're able to demonstrate whether there's a value proposition. And through that process, we learn the client's environment. They learn how our solution works. And we actually become much more in a teaming relationship as a result. So we are eager to do that with any prospect because we think it's the right way to do things. Make sure you create value for the clients and do it in a clear and visible way. Um, going forward, we're gonna be doing our simulations now using the autopilot feature because it does all that analysis for us in a very robust way, helps us introduce that feature to you as well and helps you gain confidence at the onboarding process. So simply reach out, let us know if you're interested in doing a simulation. It's a simple uh, data pull from your ERP environment of your historical demand, some item master data, and away we go and we can bring up uh, the system and show you what the results would be for your environment. Okay, last point. Our user conference is coming up here in Atlanta at the uh, end of April, April 30th and May 1st. Uh, it's gonna be at a hotel right next to the uh, Atlanta airport, so easy to access if you're traveling in. Uh, so under the tag name, Accelerate Your Supply Chain, we're all about driving results and helping you move your supply chain to a better place. If you're interested, uh, promotional materials are going to be coming out very shortly in the next week and two, a week or two, and then going forward to that. Love to see all our, of our clients there, our partners, as well as any uh, of those of you who are interested in potentially adopting our platform and seeing what this is all about. It's a great opportunity to collaborate with other industry professionals. Uh, other customers um, see more about our solutions and our capabilities and uh, hopefully set you on a good path to uh, further improving the results in your supply chain environment. All right. Thanks all for your attendance and participate <laughs> participation today. We greatly appreciate your interest. You all have a great day and we look forward to working with you in the near future. Thanks all.